So today we are going to talk about uh, Elizabeth Warren's response. Excuse me, I said Elizabeth Warren. Marianne Warren. Elizabeth Warren's a different philosopher. Uh, Marianne Warren's um, response to Tom Regan's paper. So our last lecture, uh, we went over Tom Regan's case, his argument for the idea that animals have rights, that all animals... Um, that at least insofar as they're subjects of a life, which is going to be most animals, um, they have rights because they're subjects of a life. And importantly, um, the reason that they have rights is because being a subject of a life is what is the ground or the justification or the sort of the foundation for um, having inherent value, intrinsic value that should be respected. And so because animals are subjects of a life, that means, just like with humans, they have inherent or intrinsic value. And that intrinsic value grounds rights. They have claims against being harmed, against being used. Um, and so this idea that um, we should get rid of, completely get rid of uh, animal research, factory farming, or any really any commercial ag uh, animal agriculture, and then commercial or sport hunting... Uh, Regan tried to defend this total abolitionist view. We should get rid of all this stuff. And he thought the utilitarian view that's based in welfare, um, or in other words, based in uh, concerns about the suffering of animals, he thought that's a good idea. I mean, it's it's got a lot going for it in certain ways, but it's not going to be able to get us all the way to abolition of these, what he thinks are terrible practices of using animals as resources treating animals as if they are they are kind of tools or at least objects in a certain sense for us to use at our pleasure or at our will for our own benefits. That's really bad, he thinks. And so we need total abolition. And he thinks welfare can only get us part of the way there. Um, concerns about welfare and animal suffering can only get us part of the way there. Really what we need to do is recognize that animals have rights. And most importantly... And this will be the kind of the focus of um, Warren's paper. Um, she wants to focus on the fact that he thinks animals have rights in the same sense that humans have rights. Really to the same degree. That's going to be her sort of sticking point. So we'll see her. This won't be very long. This is not a very long paper. Uh, but we'll see Warren's critique of, of Regan on animal rights. Okay, and her paper is called Speaking of Animal Rights. And we'll see, obviously, she's going to focus on, on uh, the right stuff, but we'll see sort of at the end why she's uh, why she named the titled the paper Speaking of Animal Rights because she's going to address a few objections about why we should even talk about animal rights. All right, so Regan's view, Tom Regan's view, was that animals have the same rights as humans, okay, as I just said, uh, at least in terms of their not being harmed, having like a claim or a right against being harmed, um, and in particular being used in often harmful ways. Um, really, he doesn't even it doesn't even have to be harmful. You just you can't use an animal, control them, um, make them do things uh, un, sort of unwillingly in a sense, um, just for our own benefit. Even if it's not really that harmful, he thinks this is bad. Um, so you can't harm or use animals in the same sense, for the same reasons that you can't use and harm other humans for the benefit of others, um, because they have rights. Okay. And based on this, based on his arguments that uh, animals have rights and those rights protect them from being harmed or used, um, based on that, we should ab abolish all animal research, all commercial agriculture, and all hunting of animals. Right? We shouldn't kill them. For our own benefits. Okay, and so Warren calls this view the strong animal rights position. The strong animal rights position. Total abolition of these practices based on the idea that animals have the same kinds of rights to the same degrees as humans, at least with respect, again, to considerations of harming them or using them. Okay. An animal has just as strong of a right as a human not to be harmed. Okay, and utilitarians, the welfare theorists, want to say something similar, but what they want to say is the suffering that an animal has, 
or that an animal might experience is the same, is worth the same, is morally the same as the same amount of suffering in the human. So if you take an animal and a human they, if, and give them equal suffering, that's equally bad. Okay, That's a kind of Singer view, a kind of welfarist view, utilitarian view. And Regan wants to come to a similar, at least practical, conclusion that this means we should stop killing them, and it's wrong to kill them, it's wrong to use them, it's wrong to experiment on them, but it's more than just that their pain is the same, of the same value. Equal pain, equal value. It's more than that. It's that they have an equal right, a claim, a moral claim against us. It's not just in the, in the nature of pain being bad. It's the fact that the animal in virtue of more than just their pain, in virtue of being a subject of a life, has a right against being harmed. And that right gets violated when we harm them, when we use them. And it's the, it gets violated in the same way that the human's right gets violated. Okay. That's the strong animal rights position. Now, Warren wants to argue that that's false. It's at least false, she says, in the way that Regan argued for it. Okay, so she's going to pose problems for his particular argument, and she's going to try to defend what she calls the weak animal rights view. Okay, so she does not deny that animals have rights. She thinks animals do have rights, and if you remember from the Regan lecture that he gave, um, or not gave, he, he criticized a couple different ways in which you might argue that an, um, animals don't have rights. So uh, some tried, some would try to say that animals don't, or there's no direct duty to animals. Okay, so maybe there's a duty to like not um, damage other people's property. And you might think an animal is someone else's property. And so you can't damage their property. So you can still get wrong actions involving har harming animals, but it's not because there's a direct duty to animals because they don't have rights. That's one way to do it. He argued against that. But another way which is where Warren's going to fall in, is that you might think there are rights against hurting animals. Animals do have rights. You might think animals do have rights, sure, but they're not as strong as human rights. And so that might leave room to override the animal's rights so that you can get great benefits to the human. So you might try to justify animal research, for instance, animal medical research, um, a res medical research using animals, experimenting on animals for medical research. You might try to justify that not by denying that animals have rights. You might think, yeah, they do have rights, but we can still justify things like medical research on animals because their rights aren't as strong as our rights. And we have rights. And we have uh, value and benefits that, that we want to um, help facilitate. Right? And, and the animal research can do that. And since animal rights are weaker than human rights, we can get this kind of overriding. And that's sort of the position that Warren wants to be in. That's at least kind of the camp or the category that she wants to be in. Animals do have rights. She does not deny that. Okay, And she even agrees, she wants to even, at least for the sake of argument, grant that being a sentient subject of life is why animals have rights. Because they're sentient. They're, well, because they're a, a sentient subject of a life. They have a conscious experience of the world. Okay? And if you want to argue, oh, some animals don't have conscious experience, it's like that's, that's just the empirical facts. That's not the theoretical stuff. She wants to say, if you think that a, a, you know, a salmon, for instance, or a chicken doesn't, is not the subject of a life, they don't have any conscious experience that they, that they have. Right? There's no consciousness that they, that they have as... Um, a subjective experience. If you want to argue that, she's going to say, okay, fine, that doesn't do anything to my argument. That just is an, um, an objection about where the argument applies. Okay, and that's based on the, roughly at least, on the empirical facts, you might say. So she's, that's a separate issue, right? She, she just says, look, if you have, if you have a sentient subject of a life, then you do get some rights. They do have rights. But, so they do have rights. Animals do have rights. But, they don't have rights that are as equally strong as human rights. There's a difference there, a fundamental difference. And Regan tried to reject that difference. He, he thought there was no rational way to make that difference, and she's going to try to do that. Okay, so she's going to call her view the weak animal rights position because it does hold that animals have rights, but it doesn't hold that those rights are as strong as human rights. 
So it's weaker than Regan's claim. Not weak in the sense that there's no reasons behind it or there's no argument. Weak in the sense that it doesn't claim as much. Okay. There are certain, so it's possible on her view, but not on Regan's view, that there's some cases where you can override an animal's rights, but not a human's. Right? Or you can override an animal's rights so that you can respect a human's rights. So when you kind of weigh human and animal rights against each other, there are cases in which the human rights are stronger, they went out. Okay, So that's why her, her view is weaker, because it doesn't claim as much. It says animals have rights, but it does not claim that they're as strong as human rights. Okay, so there are three stages to Regan's argument. I'll just put them up. There's So Warren says, look, Regan's argument sort of proceeds in these three steps. He says, first, animals have experiences, right? The animals have conscious experiences of their own lives. And this is, again, like, be careful here because he's not saying, and Warren's not saying that he's saying, neither Warren or Regan are saying that an animal has, like, reflective... Uh, sort of self-awareness and they can think about their own actions and like we don't have to give them this really robust kind of complex higher order experience consciousness all we need to do is say that animals actually experience their life that they are conscious that's really all it's saying and we don't know what degree they're conscious to right it might be a really minimal degree but the being a subject of a life just means you have experiences of your own life and what's happening to it. You can experience pain, sorry, pain, <laughs> if it's going worse than it was before, or if you have some other experience, maybe a chemical reaction, maybe something um, damages your, your body, um, or maybe something helps you, right? Maybe it gives you a good, good experience. Maybe just the nature of the experience is that it's good or does something else. We have experiences of our lives going better and worse, and animals have this kind of conscious experience too. They are aware of what's happening to some degree. They are aware of the world and their interaction with it to some degree. Okay, That's what it means to be a subject of life. So animals are subjects of a life. That's step one. Step two, because animals are subjects of a life, Okay, for that reason, in virtue of their being a subject of a life, that means that they have inherent value. So this, being a subject of a life, gets you inherent value. Okay. Being a subject of a life means that you have inherent value. And since animals are a subject of a life, it follows that animals have inherent value. And moreover, Regan thinks they have inherent value, at least with respect to what we can do to them, to using them, to harming them, to the same degree as humans, because inherent value, Regan thinks, does not come in degrees. It's on or off. If once you're a subject of a life, you have inherent value. <laughs> okay. And there's no degrees there. You just have it or you don't. Right. Finally, the third step is that Regan says equal inherent value entails equal moral rights. So inherent value is what grounds moral rights. If you're a subject of a life, that's the ground, the foundation for having inherent value. Having inherent value is the ground or foundation for having moral rights. And in particular, moral rights about, again, not harming you, the right not to be harmed, the right not to be used unjustly. Okay, And there's no degree of inherent value. And so there's going to be no degree of moral right related to that value. So an animal has the same right to the same degree not to be harmed than another human because they're both equally a subject of a life. Okay, they're equally a subject of a life. More, having more experience, more robust conscious experience for Regan is just going to be about the ability to experience more and less uh, suffering and well-being. So different, more complex, more sophisticated, more robust uh, uh, types of experiences are going to be more robust types of well-being. So you can have greater and lesser and sort of uh, more complicated, more complex, more robust 
uh, experiences of well-being and suffering, and that's going to track the degrees of subject of a life. But having the inherent value doesn't come in the degrees like that. Once you get sub two two uh, two beings, uh, an animal and a, and a human, will have equal. Well, sorry, will be subjects of a life in the same way. Right, the human might have more experiences, more kinds of experiences it can have, but they're equally a subject of a life. They're equally things that can experience the world, roughly, and and things that happen to them, their own lives. Right? But once you get that, then both of them are going to have inherent value in virtue of that feature being a subject of a life. They're going to have inherent value to the same degree with respect to that. Right? And that's going to ground their rights, their right not to be harmed, the right not to be used. Okay, Those are the three steps. Now, Regan concludes from that that we have a direct duty to respect animals, to respect their rights. And direct duty is not to harm animals, right? Respect their rights if they, for instance, you know, need more um, uh, room to, in order to flourish minimally. Or if you come across an animal that you see is in a trap and you can easily free it, things like that. You respect their rights, you help them out. You don't harm them, okay, these kinds of things. Regan concludes that because animals have inherent value and equal rights, or rights based on that value, based on the same kind of value that humans have, we have a duty, a direct duty. It's about, the duty is about the animals. The obligation is about the animal. It's not about something else, like not stealing or not um, causing harm just in general. It's the, the animals are directly caught up in what the duty is. It's because they have intrinsic value. So there's an intrinsic need to respect their right to not harm them. Okay, There's an intrinsic duty to do that. And that duty, that obligation we have, or those prohibitions that we have against harming them, those are, they have those, animals have those in the same way that we have towards humans. Sorry, we have those obligations and those duties in the same way that we have them towards other humans. Okay. Animals have the same rights as humans. So in the same sense that you have to respect the rights of, an, of a human being and not use them for your own benefit or harm them unnecessarily or whatever, um, same thing is going to apply to animals in the same way. Okay. Now, we will point out that Regan actually does think that, that an animal's rights can be overridden. Okay, that an animal's rights can be overridden in favor of a human's rights. He thinks that that's possible, but it's not because their inherent value is different. Okay, for Regan, it's about the consequences. Now, remember he says, um, you remember from the last lecture, he, he says, utilitarianism, this view that's based, that, that focuses on animal welfare, animal suffering and pain and suffering and trying to reduce animal suffering, that view has a lot right to it. The, the amount that you harm an animal can change how wrong the action is, okay? So it might be, or the, the amount that you harm any sentient creature can change how wrong the, the action is. So it's equally wrong to harm an animal as it is to harm a human if you're just thinking in virtue of violating their right. They both have an equal right not to be harmed because they're a subject of a life that has inherent value. Okay, so it's equally wrong to harm one as it is to, uh, is to harm the other, everything else being equal, right? But if the action, you say you like, um, I don't know, stab them or poke them with a knife or something, um, that's equally wrong in, in virtue of this stuff here because it violates their rights. But let's say that a human is going to experience much more pain than the animal, okay, for whatever reason. Let's just say it doesn't have as many pain receptors or... Um, we can just do another thing, right? You you can um, take away, um, an, uh, cut down a squirrel's tree, let's say. Take away an animal's home. But you could take away a human's home too, right? But you might think, let, let's just stipulate, that the consequences of taking away the squirrel's home, of cutting down the tree, are just really not as bad. It's, it's going to, you know, be kind of flustered maybe for a little bit and have to find a new home. And so there's going to be some effort it has to put in. Um, and let's just say it doesn't kill any other animals, it doesn't kill its children or anything like that. Um, it just has to find a new tree, right? Put in some extra work, 
So that's bad, you know, there's negative consequences, and it just violates its right. You don't have a right to, to take away the animal's home, right? You've, you violated its right to not be harmed, messed with, used, whatever, right? And let, now let's say you do that to a human. Well, it's, you have the same kind of rights violation, at least at the bottom, but it may be much more traumatic and harmful psychologically in terms of the, the suffering experienced for the human. And if that's true, then it's a worse wrong to, to take the human's home, to destroy the human's home, than it is to destroy the squirrel's home. And that's not because this stuff is different. The squirrel and the human have equal inherent value in terms of being a subject of a life. And so they have equal rights against being harmed in this way. Okay. But if the consequences are overwhelmingly terrible in one direction for the human as opposed to the animal, right, uh, then it's going to be a worse wrong. So you can have a kind of overriding right. You can override the right. If you could only destroy the human's house or the squirrel's house, Regan's going to be like, well, yeah, probably destroy the squirrel's house because it's going to be much less traumatic for the squirrel. They don't have as sophisticated of an experience or whatever. But he's going to say, let me point out, you there is a right there that you would be violating. But we can override that right in order to not do a worse wrong and violate the human's rights. Okay, so it's possible. He thinks it's possible for that to happen. But what's important, though, is that if the right is overridden, Okay, it's overridden in the very same way for humans. You have the same sorts of considerations. So if we just found out that let's say the human has two houses and they don't actually we're going to destroy their house tomorrow. And so they don't even care about this house. Right? But it's still theirs and they don't want you to do it. They want to do it on their own. And let's say that the squirrel's going to die uh of, you know, hypothermia or something it's going to freeze to death if it doesn't have its home there's no other tree it can find well that's a lot more terrible right so he's going to say well you're just going to have to override the human's rights in that case and destroy their house and respect the squirrel's rights so it's about the consequences for him in terms of the worst wrongs right so it's possible to override an animal's rights if the consequences swing in one way drastically but we'd have to accept that the same thing can go the other way and the reason is because this is all the same. Again, the the being a subject of a life gets you inherent value. And humans and animals are subjects of a life in the same kind of way. He doesn't think it comes in degrees, really. Or at least not the inherent value. Right? Just once you're a subject of a life, whatever it takes, the minimum level of being a subject of a life, if you get that, you have inherent value to the equal equal degree as everything else that's a subject of a life. And that gives you equal rights against being harmed and used and so on. <laughs> okay, But sometimes it can be overridden if the consequences in terms of suffering or well-being are drastically different. Okay, Now Warren steps in here and she says, well, look, um, she, she says there are cases where it's going to be permissible to override an animal's rights, but not a human. Okay. So what Regan was trying to say at the end here was if animals' rights are overridable, they're overridable in the same way for humans, right? Well, if rights in general, if you can override some right to like not be harmed or some right to be have your bod body respected or um, your property respected or um, just a right to be um, uh, treated in kind ways or, and not, not have cruelty against you, if there are rights like that that can be overridden, they have to be overridden in the same way for humans and animals because those rights come from their inherent value, which come from being a subject of a life, and that's all the same for animals and humans, for Regan. But Warren wants to say, mm, I don't know. I don't think so. I think you can override a human's, or, sorry, you can override an animal's rights, but not a human's, at least in some cases. Okay, And that's just to say that humans have stronger rights than animals. That's what Warren wants to argue for. Okay, so she accepts that animals have rights. She accepts that it's important to be a subject of a life that gives you this kind of inherent value, but it doesn't mean that everyone that's a subject of a life has equal inherent value. And therefore, it doesn't mean that they have equal rights. And in fact, she thinks humans have stronger rights than animals. <laughs> okay, so now let's go to her um, attack on, on Regan's argument. So 
Warren's first thing that she starts with is to say that, look, here's what his argument depends on. Okay. It depends on what it means to have inherent value, how that works. Okay, we can kind of get a basic idea of what is being a subject of a life is, just being conscious roughly to sort of any degree. Um, and so what he does, right, is to, we just saw this, is goes from step one, which is animals are being a subject, are, are a subject of a life, and therefore animals have rights. So get, being a subject of a life gets you rights, okay, so he makes that move, right? But in, in between being a subject of a life, whoops, and having rights, is this idea of inherent value. So it's essential to his view. You go from being a subject of a life to that grounding inherent value to that giving you equal rights. And so this is just really, really important. It's fundamental. If we don't know what this means, it's not going to be um, uh, uh, justified how we can get from here to here. Because we have to have some sense made of this because this is supposed to be doing a lot of work. Okay. So she's just here is just pointing out how important this concept of inherent value is to Regan's view. It's what gets him from subject of a life to rights. Okay. Being a subject of a life entails having inherent value and having inherent value entails having rights. So we really need to know what inherent value means. But her objection is going to sort of stick with this point that we have no idea what Regan means by inherent value. That's not the only objection she has, but it's one of them. Okay. Regan's argument, because it rests on this idea of inherent value, it's that idea of inherent value is really, really central to his argument. Therefore, because his argument rests on that, it's his argument is only as good as that concept. If the concept's not good, if it's implausible, if it doesn't make sense, if we don't know how to understand it, then we can't really make sense of his argument as a whole. Okay, because it's the connecting bridge between being a subject of a life and having rights. Right? So if we can't make sense of inherent value, then we can't make sense of the argument. Or if we can make sense of inherent value, but it's a bad or implausible definition or understanding of inherent value, then the argument is also going to be bad or implausible. Okay, so the argument and the concept of inherent value are going to rise and fall together, rise or fall together. All right, so all Warren's kind of um, unhappy with Regan's uh, kind of definition or characterization of that because she says all he does is, is um, describe inherent value in this negative way. He's like, look, it's, it's something with inherent value, their value doesn't depend on anything external, right? Sorry for the little typo here. Uh, you can't use that person for the benefit of others, right? So the the benefit of others, like other people experiencing good things or other people not experiencing bad things, maximizing other people's well-being and or minimizing their suffering, that's external to the thing that has value that you're using. Right, that's ex external consequences. That has nothing to do with the person being used, right? And and if you think someone has intrinsic value, that value does not depend on anything external. That's just kind of the definition of intrinsic value. It just doesn't depend on things outside of that thing. It, the value is intrinsic, inherent. It is in that person, by you know, without reference to other things. So it's not a function of their sentience. It's, that is to say, it's, their value is not a function of how well they're doing, of how much experience, good experiences they have or negative experiences they have. It's not about that. Regan tries to use that as extra stuff about what makes an action more right or wrong, but that's not about giving the entity value. That thing has value independently of its experiences. Okay, if you have two animals that are exactly the same in almost every way except one of them has just incredible amounts of pain and the other one has incredible amounts of well-being okay they're still going to have equal intrinsic value that stuff doesn't change change their intrinsic value right and he wants to say it's not a property of groups or systems intrinsic value inherent value at least in the sense that we get um the inherent value that comes from being a subject of a life is not the property of a group so like a species doesn't have inherent value at least in this sense for Regan, okay, 
because the value is grounded in being a subject of a life and the species is not a subject of a life or even just a family of deer or lion or whatever. The family is not a subject of life. Each member of the family is a subject of the life. Okay. And so it's each member that has the intrinsic value and not the group as a whole. Okay. So he, I mean, that all makes sense. Warren doesn't think that that's implausible or doesn't make any sense. What she's worried about is this, this stuff doesn't tell us what inherent value is. It tells us what it isn't. It's not something that depends on external things to the individual. It's not a function of, it doesn't depend on how much well-being or suffering the thing has. Okay. It's not something that a group can have. It's about the individuals. Like, okay, we get it. Like that's helping kind of characterize it, but that doesn't tell us what it is. What is the intrinsic value? What is this inherent value? And more importantly, how is it connected to being a subject of a life sort of more specifically, right? Other than just one being the foundation for the other. And we'll get to that last point in a little bit lower, but the point here is that Regan just doesn't really say anything, okay? And if you don't have an account of what inherent value is, it's hard to see how you can make this connection between being a subject of a life and having rights because inherent value is supposed to be doing that work in the middle, right? So without a positive account, if you say it's not this, I could say, you know, inherent value is not a chair. Inherent value is not a baseball game. Inherent value is not a butterfly. That, fine, okay, inherent value is not all those things. Inherent value is not something that's red, right? We can say all these kinds of things that inherent value is not, and some of them may be helpful, some of them may not be helpful. Um, these seem to be fairly helpful in getting kind of an understanding, but we still don't know what it is. A negative characterization is often insufficient. So we need a positive account as well that sort of tells us more about what in fact this thing inherent value is. And that's going to help connect being a subject of a life with having rights. Okay, But if you don't have that, that connection is left unclear. That's what Warren is objecting to here. Okay, And part of the reason she wants to object to that is to say that is by saying that rights an inherent value can come apart. So this move here from being a subject to the life, subject of a life, means that you have inherent value, and having inherent value means that you have, e have rights, equal rights. Everything with inherent value has equal rights. Right? That's the move, but she's saying, one, if you don't tell us what this is, it's not clear how we get from here to here. But secondly, this inherent value and equal rights, sorry, rights, I should say, inherent value and rights come apart. They come apart. So if you don't tell us what this is, it's not clear how we can get this connection. Because on their own, without knowing too much, they come apart. And here's how, right? So there's even a less connection between these things if we don't know what inherent value is, because again, they can come apart on their own. And it's only by telling us like what you mean by incoherent, or sorry, what you mean by inherent value right, and what you, what kind of rights, how rights can connect to that, you have to start filling in the positive account or else these things are not going to be really connected. And here's how they can come apart. So it's, she thinks it's not incoherent. It's not incoherent. So it is coherent. It makes sense sometimes to say that something X has inherent value, but X does not have rights. She thinks that that can make sense. An example she gives is like a mountain. A mountain, she thinks, might have inherent value. I don't think she wants to try to make a stand on that, but what she's saying is, look, it's not. this is not incoherent. This is not like saying round square, right? A mountain can have inherent value, she thinks. But it doesn't make sense to say it has rights. It doesn't make sense to say I was right. You have to like be a thing that can um, sort of uh, be a subject of those rights. And a mountain is not really a subject of anything. It's not like a subject of an experience. Um, so she wants to say there are times where something with inherent value might not have rights. And she thinks it might go the other way too. I can't remember what her examples are for that. 
but you know, she only needs one way anyways. But the point is that these come apart. Having inherent value and having rights, she thinks, can sometimes come apart. She does think that they're going to go hand in hand sometimes, maybe a lot of the times. But the point is just, if they can come apart sometimes, and Regan doesn't tell us what this means, then these two things are just going to slip apart from each other. We're just not going to know how this is supposed to get us this. Because it's not like, the point of this here is to say, it's not like these things come together all the time. It's not like if you get this one, you always get this one. So you need to say more about this. That's what she's saying to Regan. You need to tell us what this means, right? Okay, now, while inherent value might help, okay, it might help fix the problems with utilitarianism and get us to what he calls this, um, uh, what do you call it, extreme abolitionism, the purest form of abolitionism, totally getting rid of all this stuff. Utilitarianism can't do that. It has downfalls. And reaching for inherent value, trying to pull that in, it can help. Remember the vessel problem. Utilitarian doesn't care about individuals, just cares about the total aggregate well-being. And in pulling inherent value in can help solve that problem. right? But she says it can only help if it makes sense and it's clear. But if you introduce this concept... And you don't tell us what it means, you're going to just have further problems. You're not going to solve utilitarians' problems. You're going to have just more problems about what this means, how it's supposed to be connected to rights, when sometimes they come apart. So, um, yeah, so that, that's the idea. And if you don't tell us what this means, you're going to block this central move here from being a subject of a life to getting to equal rights. You need inherent value to do that. Okay, now, uh, that was there. Yes, so that's the first kind of line of reasoning. Okay, inherent value is a core, core concept. It's the key. It's the bridge between being a subject of a life and animals having, animals being a subject of a life and animals having rights. He doesn't go from being a subject of a, li uh, of a life to having rights directly, he goes through the idea of inherent value. Being a subject of a life gives you inherent value. And then having inherent value gives you rights against being harmed and used. Okay, so she's saying that concept is super, super central to his argument. But he just doesn't tell us what it means. It's obscure. He characterizes it in negative terms. He doesn't give us a positive account. Okay, sometimes rights and inherent value come apart. So we do need a positive account but we don't get that. So that's the problem. That's one problem. Okay, here's the second problem that Warren raises against Regan's, uh, Regan's argument. So not only is the concept unclear, but Regan seems to think, seems to say, or at least imply, that inherent value does not come in degrees. It's on or off, right? A living being that's a subject of a life either has full inherent value or it doesn't. And that's based on what? Whether or not they're a subject of a life. So there may be some threshold or something like that, but all he says is once you're a subject of a life, however you meet that, then you have full inherent value. Okay, so if a snail is a subject of a life and I am a subject of a life, on Regan's view, this is... Warren's interpretation. On Regan's view, the snail and I have equal inherent value and thus equal rights not to being harmed or used. Okay, If we set aside consequentialist utilitarian concerns about um, suffering and well-being, okay, just with respect to violating the right not to be used or harmed, I'm the same as a snail. Okay if we're both subjects of a life. So there's really two groups, right? There's those that have inherent value. Well, we should say those that are subjects of a life and therefore have inherent value. And thus, that gives them full moral rights. But then there's those that are not subjects of a life, like a mountain, and thus don't have inherent value, and thus don't have any moral rights. That's supposed to be the idea on Regan's view. Okay. Inherent value is binary. 
It's on or off. And therefore, your moral rights, since they track your inherent value, are also going to be on or off. You have them or you don't. What this means is there needs to be a sharp line between those that have inherent value, full moral rights, and those that don't, and thus don't have any moral rights. Now, what does that mean? It means there needs to be a sharp line for who is a subject of a life. Right? So on Regan's view, being a subject of a life is the key, or is the, is the starting point, at least. Inherent value is kind of the the bridging key, but being a subject of a life is, is where we start, right? That's kind of what gets you the inherent value. But that seems to come in degrees. I should move here. Um, right, so whether or not you're a subject of a life will tell, you, will tell us if you're something that has intrinsic value. That's the distinction, being a subject of a life. That's the line. Right, so again, inherent value is supposed to be binary. It's supposed to be on or off. You have it or you don't. And since um, inherent value is what gets you moral rights, then that's going to be on or off. And you have it or you don't. Right, so but how do you get inherent value? We need some line to separate those with inherent value and, mor and moral rights from those that don't have inherent value or moral rights. Well, how, what's the line? Being a subject of a life. That's the line. Because that's what gets you inherent value. But, now here's Warren's objection. Being a subject of a life is not binary. It's not on or off. Right? It's not on or off. It comes in degrees. Some creatures are more, sub, more a subject of a life than other creatures. They have more conscious experience. They have more capacity, more um, not just more kinds of experiences they can have, but their experience itself is more experiential in a sense. That's the thought. Like, so how much consciousness you have, how much awareness, how much experience you can experience comes in degrees. That's the point. Okay. So being a subject of a life has to do with experiences, self-awareness, other mental capacities, right? And these come in degrees. And thus, since being a subject of a life is about like how the, the way in which you can experience how much self-awareness you have, how much mental capacities you have. Subject of a life is going to come in degrees too, if these things do, right? So the, the problem is it seems arbitrary to draw a line somewhere that distinguishes subjects of a life from non-subjects of a life. It seems arbitrary. What would be the criteria for that? Okay, so look, there are a lot of unclear cases where we don't really know how much self-awareness, how much sentience, that is the ability to experience uh, pleasure and pain, suffering and well-being. Um, and though, uh, and, and so, sorry, um, therefore, on our, like, um, um, sorry, hold on. Oh, right, right, sorry, sorry. So there's self-awareness, there's sentience, that's, it can be rudimentary, right? It can be really, really low, but still seems like they're a subject of a life to some degree, right? Like, again, think of a snail, think of a butterfly, maybe even a worm. Um, I don't know how far we want to go down to, like, um, I don't know, viruses. Are supposed to be alive. Are they subjects of a life? Well, like, how far down we go. But we can go down pretty far to, to pretty, rudim to pretty um, primitive animals, and we, it seems like we can get cases where you have really rudimentary awareness, really minimal awareness, sentience, what we roughly would call mental capacities or psychological capacities, agential capacities, right? But it still seems like they're a subject of a life to some degree, right? And so that's why she's saying it seems arbitrary to draw a line. Like, like where would you do that? Okay. At any point on the spectrum, it would be an arbitrary place to say, there you go, that's a subject of a life. This much self-awareness, but not this other little tiny bit less. This one is uh, being a subject of a life. And if you just have a tiny bit less, that's not. Or sentience or whatever else is supposed to count towards being a subject of a life, it seems arbitrary to draw the line somewhere. 
that's a worry. Because if this is on or off, and this is on or off, what makes the difference? Something needs to make the difference. Well, being a subject of a life makes the difference on Regan's view. But we have a, being a subject of a life being graded, being coming in degrees, but these not coming in degrees. And that seems very odd. Okay, It seems odd because, I mean, imagine, put it this way. Imagine if we said um, how sweet a drink is is on or off. A drink is either sweet or it's not sweet. It doesn't come in degrees. Now you might think that's crazy and just set that aside for a second, but just pretend that how sweet a drink is does not come in degrees. Okay, it's either sweet or it's not. Okay, so now we need a distinction between sweet and not sweet drinks. Well, what makes the difference? Let's pretend that it's sugar content. The amount of sugar in the drink determines whether or not it's going to be sweet or not. Okay, but the amount of sugar comes in degrees. Okay, so if whether the drink is sweet or not is on or off, it doesn't come in degrees. But the thing that determines that does come in degrees. That seems very odd. Now we have a kind of arbitrary way, um, or we we have an arbitrary um, approach to figuring out which drinks are sweet because if the sugar content comes in degrees, but then we just pick. Uh, a, a point, we say, oh, okay, this much sugar, that's sweet. Anything less than that, that's not sweet. Well, like, why isn't it like less sweet, you know, and more sweet as opposed to sweet and not sweet? Because there's more and less sugar. And if sugar is telling us what's sweet, why don't we have more and less sweet instead of on or off sweet? Same kind of thing. If subject of a life comes in degrees and that's supposed to be determining whether or not something has inherent value, well, shouldn't whether you have inherent value come in degrees too? Shouldn't you have more or less value and not on or off value? Or if you have on or off value and the thing that determines that is subject of life, then you better have on or off subject of life. But what Warren is saying is that it doesn't really seem like you do have on or off. Subject of life is graded. It's not on or off. It's not binary. Okay, so then once you get that, gradation, this degrees here, once you get that and you try to use that to determine something else, but in a binary way, in an on or off way, you're going to have this arbitrariness problem. It's going to be arbitrary at which point you say this much subject of a life is enough to say you have inherent value and just the whatever unit, one little tiny unit less, you don't have inherent value. Okay, So you get an arbitrariness problem. Now, uh, Regan's theory can't seem to tell us how we're supposed to interact with those unclear cases. So all these gray cases where we're not really sure whether they're a subject of a life, okay, like how much consciousness does a slug have? How much consciousness does a gnat have? How much consciousness does a um, tapeworm have? It's very, very hard, right? These very unclear cases. And if we're supposed to have moral guidance from our view of, um, animal ethics, right? How can we do that if this comes in degrees and we're not really sure what's supposed to be the threshold, the deciding line? Therefore, we're not going to know when a creature has inherent value or not. So we're not going to know what to do. We're not going to know if they have rights and we have to respect them or not, especially in these un really unclear cases. And we want our moral theories to guide us. And so Regan has kind of a problem here, right? But Regan says, look, why don't we just give the benefit of the doubt to the unclear cases? Why don't we just give the benefit of the doubt? Just say, if it's unclear, treat it as if it has an um, inherent value. Treat it like it's a subject of a life. But if we treat all the unclear cases like that, we're just going to have these crazy obligations, it seems like. Obligations not to... Um, remove or harm or disrupt things that we seems like maybe we have the right to do or that we're not doing anything wrong suppose like you know a, a bunch of termites have made their way into your house and it's literally going to like destroy and crumble your house unless you do something about it and you don't have the money to buy a new house you have just enough money barely let's say and it's already going to harm you to pay for the exterminator to help take care of this 
right? So what if that happens? Well, it seems like we can exterminate the termites if there's going to be a really, really great loss to the humans, right? And let's say there's a really big risk of it crumbling the house, possibly when the humans are in there, hurting or maybe killing them. They need to do something about it, right? Super impractical to pick up all the termites one by one and put them safely into the yard, <laughs> right? So the point here is that we would have obligations that seem implausible if we just assumed that all these unclear cases of animals where we're not sure if they're subjects of a life if we just treated them like they were, and then on Regan's view, that means treating them like they have inherent value and the moral moral rights, we're going to have really obligations that seem really implausible. So then what we're going to have to do is say, all right, all right, all right. Let's not apply the benefit of the doubt everywhere, but let's just apply it where it like makes more sense. Right? But then we're just going to have the arbitrary list line again. Where does it make sense? We're going to have to figure that out. Right? So this doesn't really help. Okay, now, here is Warren's argument for why human rights are stronger than animal rights. Okay, she's given these two problems with Regan's view. One is that inherent value is very mysterious on his view, but that's bad because it's a really important concept to his argument, right? And the second is that inherent value is supposed to do this work of determining, like, who has moral rights and who doesn't, and it's also on or off. Right, it's binary. Right, but the thing that determines inherent value, subject of a life, is not binary. It's graded, and so you have this arbitrariness. Where do we draw the line? We have these unclear case problems, and it's hard to see how something that is graded comes in degrees, like subject of a life, can determine something that's supposed to be binary. That seems odd. Okay, now we're going to get a positive argument from her for why human, uh, human rights are, more, are stronger than animal rights. Okay? So she points to a difference between humans and animals that's grounded in the capacities for being a subject of a life. Okay? What capacities are, are there are grounding you being a subject of a life? And what she thinks is most important is our ability to be moved by reason. Okay. So she's staying with this subject of a life thing. She likes this kind of basic idea. She thinks being a subject of a life really is important to, to having value, to having rights. But we need to say more. And what she wants to say is some of those capacities that sort of ground your, your being a subject of a life, in the case of humans, that's going to be our ability to be moved by reason. That's going to be one of the important capacities that's grounding our, our subjectivity. Okay, so being a subject of a life is more whoops, is morally compelling. Okay, it's morally compelling because we can recognize this fact as a moral reason. Because we can recognize that other things have the capacity to be for conscious experience, because we can recognize that other things are subjects of a life, that gives us moral reasons. Being a subject of a life is morally compelling to us because we can recognize and be moved by reasons, especially moral reasons. Okay, so again, being a subject of a life is morally important to us. It's morally compelling, precisely because we can recognize that fact as a moral reason, as morally important, that things that are subjects of a life need to be respected. And we can be moved by that reason and actually respect those things because of their subjectivity, because of they're a subject of a life. So not only we, can we recognize moral reasons, but we can move ourselves, we can behave in light of those reasons. We can act accordingly. And that moral reasoning, that capacity for moral reasoning, is what makes humans and their subject of a life more important, more valuable than an animal's. Okay, why? Well, the capacity for recognizing someone as valuable in virtue of being a subject of a life, right? So the capacity for recognizing someone's being a subject of a life as a moral reason, okay, and their capacity for moral reasoning, blah, 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 right? I see myself as a subject of a life, right? That's morally relevant because it's a necessary condition on moral society, okay? We can't have a successful moral society, according to Warren, 
without this ability to recognize and respond to other people's value, to other people's capacity to see themselves as a moral agent, to see themselves as a subject of a life. Without that capacity that we see each other as moral agents, we see each other as conscious beings, that capacity is what's part of which, part of what is required for a successful moral society. We just wouldn't be able to um, engage morally with each other, have social norms, moral norms, has, have a successful um, way of progressing morally, changing ourselves if we need to, recognizing failures in morality. We just wouldn't have any of that if we didn't have this capacity for moral reasoning. Okay, sorry, take a drink. Now, if people don't give equal recognition to the moral worth of others, then we couldn't generate a, a working moral community. That's just her kind of bottom line here, what her fundamental claim is. Without this ability, we wouldn't see each other as moral agents. And if we wouldn't see each other as moral agents, we wouldn't be able to successfully cooperate with each other. And if we don't do that, we can't have a working moral community, working moral life, and therefore um, this kind of equal recognition as moral agents and have moral worth that we give each other is required for a successful moral society. And that's why that capacity is so, so important, she thinks. Okay, and can't we just put, put animals into our moral circle, you might wonder? Well, she says, no, we can't just extend this recognition of being a moral agent that's something that sees itself as a moral agent. We can't do that because that would require a mutual recognition of our own worth. Okay. On their part. Sorry. That's what I mean. It re it, in order to extend this kind of moral reasoning, this moral relevance here, right? recognizing someone's being a, being a subject of a life and their capacity... They're recognizing that individual's capacity for moral reasoning, for the same kind of moral reasoning, right? I recognize that they're a subject of a life. I recognize that they can understand that they're a subject of a life. And I recognize that they understand me as a subject of a life. All of that, you can only go halfway with animals because they're not going to be able to give it back. You need this mutual recognition. And that's what allows humans to do what we do morally, to problem solve and cooperate in the way that we do which is much more sophisticated, morally speaking. Okay, not just bare socially speaking, just morally speaking. All right, now, what the um, kind of practical upshot of having this capacity is is rec not just all the recognition stuff, recognizing that other humans are morally uh, valuable and that they can recognize their own moral value and that they recognize my moral value. It's not all the only just recognizing stuff, but we can act accordingly. Okay, the capacity is not just recognizing moral reasons, recognizing the moral worth of others. It's our ability to alter our actions in accordance with those moral reasons. And certainly... We don't really see that this is happening with animals, at least not even near the sophistication that we have. Okay. Now, an obvious worry here for Warren that's come that might come up is that some humans don't have these abilities, right? You might have infants that don't have them, mentally disabled people that don't have them, and so on and so forth. She's like, well, this capacity for moral reasoning is sort of really where, where the fundamental ground is going to be for why human rights are more valuable. Because we have this capacity, we recognize more reasons, and we're like part of this moral community. And then you might think, what about humans that don't reason that way, <laughs> that don't have moral reasoning? How, what do we do here? Well, she says, look, first of all, we give these people moral protections that we don't give animals, right? She's like, we need to recognize that. An infant, we care for them. We treat them as if they have these moral um, rights, the inherent value in the moral rights, even if they lack the capacity, right? Um, we care for them and regard them as morally valuable, 
right? But we do that for certain reasons that we don't really have for animals. For instance, emotional reasons that we're connected to infants. It would just like really destroy most people if you if they saw like a kind of let's say like a mass extinction of of infants. It'd just be crazy, right? It's like hard to even think about. But if you saw that with like crickets, if there was like a mass extinction of crickets, you might feel bad kind of, but you have these emotional and even these practical reasons for protecting infants. Uh, it would just, people would become um, um, very worried about where, where society was going and maybe worried about certain institutions if there was a certain treatment of infants, let's say. Um, and so we have protections against them so that we can continue, like like this kind of continuing with, where did it go? Uh, this necessary condition for successful moral society, not just having the capacity, I think she wants to say treating other humans in that way is necessary. And it's not, it, at least not clear that it's necessary to treat all animals that way, even though they lack this. So she wants to say there's an important lesson in the fact that we actually treat infants, mentally disabled people, and so on, as if they had full moral value, and full inherent value, and full moral rights, um, even when they don't have this capacity for, for moral reasoning. And we don't do that for animals. You might think, well, that's just what we do. And if it's emotional, all right, well, maybe our emotions are wrong, right? If it's practical, it's not clear that um, trying to fit animals into our moral circle is going to be impractical. Maybe we have to do it slowly. Maybe we have to be very clever at how we change things and change things slowly, I think is very important, but it doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily impractical. Okay, but what she wants to say is, look, these protections that we give infants, the mentally disabled and so on, those are basically the same as rights in practice, right? But that doesn't mean that anything, like crickets should have these same rights. And so she wants to say, we do, she's not going to bite the bullet. She's not like Singer. She's not going to say, yeah, well, sometimes infanticide is permissible. No. She's going to say infants and the mentally disabled and so on who might lack or otherwise have some sufficiently or significantly impaired uh, capacity for moral reasoning and, and um, turning that moral reasoning into moral action, even beings that, humans, I should say, that lack that capacity they're still properly treated as if they do. It's still appropriate to treat them as if they do and give them those moral protections. That's basically what she wants to say. Okay, so it's that capacity. So there's a lot of area here to push back on. She doesn't give a whole um, very complex defense of this view. Or, or, of, or uh, sorry, um, not a very sophisticated response to this objection. This seems like a serious objection and it seems like basically what she says is, yeah, but we treat them as if they have rights. Like, it's not clear why we can't do that with animals. It's not clear why our emotions should be that that relevant. It's not clear that it's really impractical to, to treat at least a significant amount of animals in the same way, right? All right, but that, I mean, that's the positive argument she gives. Now, she addresses this worry at the end here, there's not very much left. Um, Someone might say, okay, if animals have weaker rights than humans, and they're going to be overridden most of the time, why do we care about animal rights? Like, why even talk about this? Why do you, like the objector's saying, Warren, why are you holding on to animal rights? You think that basically all the time they're, they're weaker than human rights. Okay, human rights are going to override, right? Uh, if they're equal, I get it. Like, if Regan's right, then you know, that matters. We should talk about animal rights. But you think they're all weaker. So why even care about animal rights? Why don't we just do the cruelty kind kindness view, right? Like, don't be cruel. Give them humane treatment. Right? Don't abuse them unnecessarily. Why don't we just do that? And she says, well, I agree with, with uh, Regan. I think the cruelty kindness view is weak. Right, just rejecting cruelty to animals, just saying like, don't be cruel to animals, that's insufficient because it can allow, this is basically what Reagan said, it can allow you to harm them 
right? If you like really regret it, it's justified because maybe it produces really good benefits for us. Okay, she again, she just kind of agrees with Regan here. And she's like, you can kill animals as long as it's painless. If if all you thought was don't be cruel. Right? But she doesn't think that that's very, very good. She doesn't think like, oh, just make all their deaths painless and then it doesn't matter. No, she they have rights. She thinks they have rights. So you can't do that. But getting rid of rights talk and just focusing on, eh, don't be cruel, just be nice, that's going to allow these other things in that she doesn't want. Okay. A second reason that's important to talk about animal rights, even though they're weaker than humans, right, is that the denial of animal rights can sometimes lead people to think that you can do whatever you want to them. Okay. And so avoiding this kind of confused result is another reason to talk about animal rights. Okay, to take them seriously. All right, so why can't we just say, right, that the same thing applies to trees and mountains and so on? Right? If we want to protect trees, forests, rivers, lakes, so on, if we want to protect nature, non-living nature, why can't we just speak of rights in the same way? If, if what you're saying is we need to speak of rights so that, you know, we can avoid these bad consequences... Why can't we just do that for trees and mountains and so on? And she says, well, because, first of all, they don't have rights, in my sense. They're not subjects of a life. Okay. Sentient beings with, that are subjects of a life, they are right holders. They are protected from harm. You can't harm a mountain, she thinks. You need to be sentient. Okay. And you can't benefit a mountain where benefit means doing something that like um, um, satisfies or facilitates their interests that matter to them. They just don't have these kinds of experiences. That's why we should talk about rights. Because the alternative is insufficient. It's going to allow bad things. And secondly, the alternative is going to um, make it so that people are confused about what's important. All right, so she thinks Regan's view fails, okay, for two main reasons. The core concept whoop, uh, of inherent value is not fleshed out. He doesn't tell us what it is, so it's left obscure. It's defined negatively, right? That's the problem. Why is that a problem? The reason that's a problem, the reason that means the argument fails, is because inherent value is the key to the bridge. It gets us from being a subject of a life to having rights, but if it's obscure, it's only talked about negatively, we don't really know what it is, we don't really know how it works, it doesn't come in degrees, supposedly, but subject of a life does. So this is a problem. The core concept is problematic. That's the problem. Okay. Also, it doesn't tell us what to do in most cases with animals. We're really unsure who a subject of a life is and therefore who has inherent value and therefore who has moral rights with animals. Most of the animals we interact with on a daily basis, it's going to be really unclear whether they're subjects of a life. I'm talking insects, mostly. We're mostly interacting with insects, probably when we don't know it. Okay, insects and other really tiny creatures. If we just don't know, again, the claim is that we just don't know where subject of a life starts. We don't know what the threshold is, and so we can't know what, where the inherent value is. So we don't have any moral guidance for most of the interactions with animals that we have. I, I literally just instinctively smashed a, a little gnat that was flying in front of me. And now I, because I'm giving this talk, giving this lecture, feel a little bad about that. But you can see, like, we just interact with little creatures all the time, probably when we don't even know it. And we would have to become aware of that and be careful and so on if we thought that being a subject of a life was something that um, applied to those animals, right? And the point is just really unclear. Okay, now the weak rights view is good. That's what she, that's what she um, defended. So she thinks that view is right for three reasons, okay? And it's better than Regan's view. First of all, we still get to respect the subject of a life criteria, right? It's still about being a subject of a life 
Okay, but we don't have to draw the arbitrariness line somewhere. Okay, we don't have to say, here's the line that it draws at this point. We don't have to do that because we don't, we're not making these, uh, whoops, we're not making these three steps that Regan makes. Gosh, sorry, that was, there we go. Um, from equal, uh, just from being a subject to a life to, to having inherent value to being equal rights, she brings in this um, moral reasoning aspect. So that's that can be something that we focus on. So we don't have to draw this arbitrary line just between what it is to be a subject of a life or not. Even though being a subject of a life is important. She can, and part of the reason is she doesn't think inherent value is binary, right? That's part of the reason why we don't have to draw that line. She thinks inherent value comes in degrees, just like being a subject of a life. And so there really is no sharp line. It's just greater and lesser degrees of inherent value and being a subject of a life. So there's no need on her view to draw a line because having inherent value comes in degrees, just like being a subject of a life. And it doesn't for Regan, right? So that's an upshot of her view. Also, oops, sorry. It can tell us um, what the distinction between humans and animals is. What the distinction sort of morally is. And if you think that um, there is intuitively a difference between human and animal um, value in certain cases, her view can get you that. Moral reasoning. The capacity for moral reasoning, the capacity for being a moral agent, understanding others as moral agents, understanding yourself as a moral agent, and using those understandings, those that reason that the other person has moral value because they're a subject of a life, using all that reasoning to inform and modify your behavior. That's an important thing that's different from humans and animals, and it differs. Uh, it, it, it determines different degrees of rights. So she thinks that's a benefit as well. Now you saw that one worry is that some humans don't have these capacities. So what do we do with them? Do we treat them like animals? Do they not have moral value? And she gives a kind of weak, I think, response, which is, oh, you know, we treat them like that anyways, and that's really important that we treat them that way because it would be really, really hard and impractical for us to try to treat them as animals. Right? And those treating them that way is basically like a right. It functions like a right. So there you go. And it's like, why can't we just do that with animals? Why should we think that um, our emotional reactions and the practical benefits, supposedly practical benefits of treating such uh, humans as if they have full rights, like why should we think that that makes the difference? She doesn't really tell us that. But the last thing she says that the benefit of, of her view is that it provides a middle ground for, um, it, it provides reasons for speaking of rights, but not in a way that makes them equal to humans. Right? So this middle ground for speaking about animal rights, which she thinks is important, but not to the extreme that Regan does. All right. Now that is, uh, the, um, that concludes the, the Warren paper. Uh, which I've uploaded to Canvas. And so next week, I'm trying to think what we're talking about next week so I can give you a, a preview. Uh, speciesism, portion speciesism. I think, oh, next next is um, science and morality, I, be I believe. So we'll move on to that. But um, I'll be in office hours um, and uh, come with your questions. And yeah, that's it. Thanks.